Wendell, can I ask a question? Of course, Richard. Um, <laughs> you know, the, uh, how, do they, how do their system of measurements come about, like feet and yards, and that they, they're using Egyptian meters? Well, uh, it's, the, the clue is in the name. I mean, most of our system of measurements come from the human body. In fact, virtually all of them. I mean, think of it, the foot. The, the connection is obvious there, right? And then the cubit, like I mentioned in the first part, elbow to fingertip. And then there was the sacred cubit, which was elbow to fingertip plus a hand's breadth. You know? And then there was the, the span. There was two ways of, the, the big span was this, and the little span was this. And then there was the lick. This was called a lick in ancient England. So you would actually, you know, you could actually, with your, you know, almost like a compass, you could step things off with this right here. And there's actually a mathematical relationship going on there. Um, typically, your span is the same as your height. And then the pace, you know, you had the stride and the pace. And basically, you know, if, if you fight, like you'll notice each of these squares is one foot. So if I start out and I'm putting my heel against one of those lines and I count one, two, three, okay, then I've just done three paces, okay? If I count out a thousand of those, that's the basis of the mile. So our mile, the, the, the word mile comes from milia, which is the Latin for thousand. Because in ancient Rome, they had the city center that had the gnomon pole at the center and everything radiated out from that. And they had, we still use mile markers today that goes back several thousand years to ancient Rome, which probably went back to Egypt. And the obelisk stood in for the, for the uh, pole. And actually, if you read Plato literally, that originated in Atlantis, because Atlantis, Diodorus Siculus talks about there being a pole in the center of Atlantis. Did the metric system when they introduced that? Didn't well, the metric system was metric system was intended to be based upon the Earth, so it's geodetic in origin, and it's actually the distance along the meridian from the equator to the pole. So you take that distance, that arc, and. 1,000 meters is a kilometer, and a kilometer relates to the mile, interestingly, in almost the golden section relationship. 5,280 over, uh, let's see, the meter, I've forgotten how many feet, there's uh, 39.37 inches to a meter. Yeah, 3,280. So, it's pretty easy to remember. 5,280 feet in a mile, 3,280 feet in a meter. If you divide 5,280 by 3,280, you get 1.62, which is almost the golden section. So again, it's almost like the mile to kilometer relationship is built in right here. If this is a mile, then this is a kilometer. Or if this is the mile, then this is the kilometer, see? I think that was accidental. But then again, who knows? Because ultimately, see, when you go to ancient metrology, the origin of it was two, twofold. The human body and the earth. The earth was the other one. And what you'll find is that there are units of measurement that are derivative of the earth itself. And what, there, what would happen there, for example, you can see a globe of the earth like this. This is called lines of parallel like this. And as you can see, as you go towards the, the one pole or the other, the lines of parallel are decreasing in circumference. So if you take one degree of that circumference at the equator, that's the biggest degree. But as you move towards the poles, those degrees become shorter and shorter and shorter. Now you take a one of those degrees, divide it by 60, and you have minutes. Divide that by 60, and you have seconds. And now you can take those seconds, and what they did was, for example, the Parthenon is exactly 100 Greek feet which turns out to be um, 100, say 100 feet times 60 times 60 times 360 equals divide by 5,280. Yeah, so that's one second of, as it turns out, okay, you can take a Greek foot, which is a little bit longer than our English foot, and our Parthenon is actually about 101 feet across the front, and if you go to the latitude, 
of the Parthenon, which is in Athens, it turns out that one, one second of arc at that latitude is precisely the distance across the front of the Parthenon. So you take, in other words, you take that line around the Earth at the latitude of the Parthenon. You divide it by 360, and that's each one of those is a degree. You divide each of those degrees by 60, and you get a minute of longitudinal arc. You divide each of those minutes by 60, and you get a second of longitudinal arc. And that second of longitudinal arc is going to be varying. It's going to be greatest at the equator, and it's going to be shrinking as you move towards the North Pole. And when you get to the latitude of Athens, that second of arc is precisely represented by the distance across the front of the Parthenon. I actually have that in one of my slideshows. So it's pretty phenomenal. And that's just one example of how there, there, all the ancient measurements had one of two sources, either the Earth-based, geodetic-based, or the human scale-based. And in fact, I think in the usage of those measurements, the purpose was to try to show the linkage between the human scale and the planetary scale. What was your question? The basin's compass and the square that you show up there, is it 16th ruled or is it 10th ruled? I mean, is it metric or American? I mean, what is the rule line? It's the Eng Old English, which is, the, which is 16th. 16th. Yes, decimal base would be 10th. And... Um, you know, I, I certainly understand the, the, the purpose and value of the metric system because of its ease. Um, however, ultimately trying to relate it to anything. Like, in terms of, the, of our traditional systems of measurement, we talk about feet and inches. What was the origin of the inch? The thumb, the width of the thumb. Well, obviously, that's going to vary from person to person, right? Oh, it's across. Just like, just like your span is going to vary from person to person. If you're five foot two, you're not going to have the same pace as somebody who's six foot four, obviously. What's interesting, though, is when you take a whole lot of people and you begin to average them. See, that's when you get... Now, see, the Roman mile is shorter than the British mile. The British mile is 5,280 feet. And the implication there is that the pace, each pace... Of, if you thought of the English mile as being a thousand paces, then each of those paces is 5.28 feet, right? 5.28 feet. That actually is a sacred ratio. We find that ratio concealed in the book of Revelations. How many of you know how? In the description of the holy city, um, the city lieth four square, and the length and the height and the breadth of it are equal. Uh, 12,000 furlongs, and it had a wall great and high, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Well, if you actually work out 12,000 furlongs, what's the, what's the origin of the furlong? Or how, how do we use a furlong today, Rusty? In racing. Horse, racing. Horse racing, right. And how long is a furlong? 220 yards, which is six... What? Does it relate to a horse's leg length? You know, that's a good question, and I honestly don't know the answer to that. But, LV, if you would do some research for us, maybe... Uh... I'm, I'm not a <laughs> Oh, well. Uh, what, Richard, what do we have to erase the board here so I can write on it? Oh, my shirt. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> I've got one thought. Uh oh. That's what I'm. We're, yeah. But like you know, the leaders of a group of people you know are called rulers. Mm -hmm. And it would be the ruler's hand or foot that might be used for measure. Mm -hmm. So he's the ruler. Uh huh. Because he's. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Rusty. Okay, so we got a 5,280 foot mile. Now, that's the statute mile. There's also in use something called the nautical mile. Anybody know how much the nautical mile is? 6,000 feet. Six how much? 6,000 feet. Almost six, yeah, actually I think the, uh, in round numbers it's, um, it's a little more than 6,000. Um, 6, well, I can tell you what it is because I know where they started from. Um, 
Ah, yes. 6,080. 6,080 feet. That's it. Now, 6,080 feet happens to be uh, one minute of arc of the Earth's circumference. You know what I mean by a minute of arc? Right? When we talk about the Earth, we, we measure the surface of the Earth with lat latitude north and south, longitude east and west. And we, for example, can take a circumference around the equator, and that's going to be the Earth's largest circumference, right? Because of the spin of the Earth, it bulges towards the equator and compresses towards the poles. So the polar axis is 26 miles less than the equatorial axis. The, e the Earth is not a perfect sphere, okay? So what happens is, is that it creates an interesting geometry because it's, it's referred to as an oblate spheroid. In the advanced classes that I do, and we're not going to be able to get into that today, but I show how the ancients actually used that difference between polar and equatorial diameters and built it into some of their sacred structures. Um, probably the most uh, salient example of that is in the Great Pyramid because they put the pyramid on a 55 centimeter or one royal cubit foot base. So you can actually measure the height of the Great Pyramid two different ways, with or without that one royal cubit base that it sits on, called a socle. And you can also measure the perimeter of the base two different ways. One, there were sockets that were set outside the main bulk of the pyramid. And nobody knows exactly how they were configured because they're not there anymore. But the holes that held the sockets are there. So you can measure the existing casing stones and you can measure to the sockets. And you actually end up with two different, two different dimensions when you do that. Those two dimensions actually relate to the two dimensions of the earth, the equatorial dimension and the polar dimension. What and is the socket? Pardon? What is the socket purpose? Well, no one knows. It, apparently it held some kind of cornerstones. And I actually have a graph of what the, what, you know, the research, the, the pyramid researchers um, ha, and the architectural historians have come up with what they think it actually was. Uh, I, and it shows in the graph. And I'm, I don't have that. I have it, but we weren't going to look at it today. Because otherwise, we, but we do in the classes, when I do the extended classes, that's the kind of stuff we get into. Yeah, it's very interesting. Oh, it's very interesting. It's very interesting, yeah. Um, and it's flat on top. And it's flat on top. It may not have originally been flat. That's controversial. Well, it's a landing plane. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, well, what's interesting here is if you take a line, a, a minute of arc, okay, and I've forgotten the exact latitude at which this one occurs, but you can see that as you're going north, it's going to shrink. So you're going to find some particular latitude where it turns out one minute of arc is precisely our mile. And at that latitude, the mile becomes both geodetic and human scale derived. Again, the mile can be thought of as, as uh, a thousand paces of 5.28 feet. When you think of this 5.28, we're talking about a ratio there. That's the ratio between the length of a human pace and the length of a human foot. And no matter what the size of your foot is or your pace, the ratio is going to work out to be roughly the same. See, So if you're taller, you're going to have a, a, a longer pace, but you're also going to have a longer foot. And so the ratio is going to work out to be roughly the same. Symbolically, you know, your foot is what anchors you to the earth and your pace is what motivates you around the surface of the earth. Now, in the book of Revelations, that verse that I quoted, um, the, the, and the, the city lieth four square, and the length and the height and the breadth of it are equal, 12,000 furlongs. If we take 12,000 furlongs, and since each furlong is uh, 660 feet, now if this was in class, everybody would be having one of their little calculators. And uh, Lee, are you good with a calculator, one of these? Or should I hand it to Rusty? <laughs> Probably Rusty, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. What do we want? Okay, we got plug in 12,000. Now, do, do we trust Lee? Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, plug in 12,000, and then multiply it times 660. And then tell me what you get. Million nine hundred twenty thousand feet, right? All right. Now, if I leave off those, 
three zeros, I have 7,920. Now, Lee, what I want you to do is put that number in, 6,080, and multiply it times 60. Multiply that times 360. You see what we're doing? We've taken one minute of arc, multiplied it times 60, times 360. Now you've got a, a big number, right? Divide that by 5,280. I actually rounded this off. That's not the exact number, but it'll be close enough that you should see the, what'd you get? I'm getting 24,872, 72, 72, 72. Okay, now divide that by pi. 3.14. Yeah. 7921. Ah, yeah, so you see what we've done? This is the diameter of the Earth right here. And it's, by some curious coincidence, the number of feet in the side of the holy city is a thousand times the number of miles in the diameter of the Earth. However, in actual terms, 7,920,000 7, feet, how big is that? That's hard to grasp, that number of feet. Let's turn it into miles. Lee, can you plug in 7,920,000? Now divide that by 5,280, and we're going to see what, what, what St. John the Divine is describing. What would you get? 1,500. 1,500 is the right number. So what he's saying is that the Holy City is 1,500 feet in, I mean 1,500 miles in diameter. The first thing that that came to my mind when I was discovered this many years ago was 1,500 feet. Okay, if there's an Earth number 7920, the lunar, what's the, what's the diameter of the moon, Marcia? 2,160. 2,160. Now, this is 1,500 miles. Okay, now, there's a curious little coincidence going on here that doesn't uh, necessarily mean anything other than the fact that there seems to be these constant ratios embedded throughout the astronomical universe, but also within the sacred literature. We said 1,500 miles. So I discovered this because I was trying to think in terms of, okay, how does the holy city that's being described in the book of Revelations relate to the earth and to the moon? So first I set it up as a ratio of earth to, to the holy city, and if Lee would... Divide this number by that number and tell me what you get for a ratio between the two. 5.28. What was that again? 5.28. 5.28 is what he came up with. That's remarkable. So what's going on? That's exciting. <laughs> I wish I was a mathematician. <laughs> well, you, we're all mathematicians. I'm not a good one. Oh. <laughs> yeah, what about it? I thought you were going to do that. <laughs> oh, well, what do we get when we do the moon? When you, when you said the holy city. I, I wasn't actually going to do a, a big in-depth study of this. I was just going to kind of show an example of how there are these bizarre correlations. Once you get into the underlying mathematics of this, that's one of the principles of this whole, one of the concepts of this whole sacred geometry thing, is that there is this invisible underlying mathematics that links all of this stuff together. The the, the, the measurements we use in, in one of these programs, I may, I may be sh pulling it up today, uh, but probably not. We're going to run out of time. But if you start reading sacred literature, and this can go from the Bible to the Vedas um, to the Zendavesta, all of these books, the Tao Te Ching, they talk about measurement. Keys There's of Enoch, too. Keys of Enoch. And the Keys of Enoch, probably. I haven't read the Keys of Enoch, but I could believe that. So. Over and over again, we find things, references to, um, you know, a prophet like Zechariah or Ezekiel or John in the book of Revelations. There's this revelation that's, that's inaugurated by their meeting with this angel. And always invariable, invariably, the angel is described as having a measuring line. You know, one of the angels says to, uh, I believe it is Zechariah, he says, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. See, the angel tells them this, take this measuring line and measure the temple of God and measure the altar and measure them that worship. And then what do you suppose uh, Zechariah is going to find out when he measures? He's going to find out that there's a, there's a common 
there's a common measurement linking the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. But it's not limited to that because ultimately the measurement of the temple, the, remember you've got to realize that the temple is a model of the universe. And so in order to be an effective model of the universe, the invisible mathematics of creation that unites the, all of the cosmos together has to be incorporated into the fabric and, and pattern of the temple. When you said holy city, were you talking about Jerusalem? or you Well, Jerusalem is considered to be the earthly counterpart of the, of the spiritual holy city. That's are you talking about Vatican? Or you're talking no, no, no. I mean, this goes back. This was The book of Revelations was written before there was a Vatican. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. The whole the city the holy city is the is the city. Ezekiel describes the holy city in the Old Testament. John d describes the holy city in the New Testament. Every Buddhist temple or in Hindu temple is a representation of the holy city, which is a cosmological model of the universe, which serves as a intermediary link, a geometric link between the human scale and the cosmic scale. And again, it goes back to that thing that in the first part where we were talking about scale and variance where the larger is reflected in the smaller. Oftentimes in, in geometry, what you're doing is you're looking for the mean. That golden mean is the thing that links the small with the large, which are uh, on such disparate scales and dimensions that it's difficult to reconcile them. So you bring in a third element that serves, that partakes of both and serves to link them together and harmonize them. And, and the function of the temple in that regard was was to serve as a link between the human scale and the cosmic scale. And so in the temple, the temple was a repository of all of the cosmic dimensions. And then of course those cosmic, we, you know, like Protagoras said, man is the measure of all things. And the idea being is that we are walking embodiments of these cosmic dimensions. And we are, it can be mathematically demonstrated. In just a little bit of, in a couple of examples, I just showed you here just a few of the things, the way you can go about that. When we do the classes, we get into that in a, in a lot greater depth. Can you get into the flower of life, too? Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily have this, you know, I, don't, I, I approach it a little different. But yeah, I mean, we, in the classes, we draw it and we learn about it. We study its mathematical properties. We look at it in terms of symbolism and so forth. Yeah, um, when you talk about these um, sacred proportions in structures, mm -hmm. how we understand that the architects and the designers and the constructors were consciously choosing these I think in some case, I think in some cases they were, but not in all cases. I mean, I think we're de dealing here with things that you know emerge on an archetypal level, but just as now we're speaking of these things consciously I mean because we can actually measure these things um, we can we can evaluate them in terms of our mathematical systems and so forth I think that you know on, at least some of the people were doing it consciously I think you know the builders of the pyramid when they incorporated variant dimensions based upon the earth's shape I think that was conscious I think they knew precisely what they were doing you know it wasn't just something that was emerging out of the unconscious um, I think that because it's too precise, it's too precise. Um, my thought, my thinking is, is that, you know, essentially the cyclical nature of things is such that there are times when this hidden knowledge comes to the forefront. It's kind of like it bubbles up from below and it comes to the surface. And I think we're in one of those times right now. Other times it, it simmers below the surface and people, artists, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright built numerous buildings loaded with sacred geometry and he probably didn't even know what the term meant. He'd probably never heard of the term. But if you've been analyzing some of his buildings, I mean, I think on an intuitive level, he was manifesting these proportions of harmony. Uh, the you know. Biltmore Estate was definitely built on this harmony proportion. Well, my understanding is that, you know, Vanderbilt was a mason and wanted some of that incorporated. Mm -hmm. So I fully believe that it's there. Yes, Marty. Far as to know thyself, I mean, if you're really in tune with your own proportion, your own resonance with the proportion you create, then you're going to come up with the sacred proportions. Yeah. You, did you hear what she said? Did, yeah. And I think that's true. I mean, because the inner and the outer, and, and Keith Critchlow teaches this, that the inner and the outer are reflections of each other, and and. That's what I always tell people. I mean, you can learn about the world out here by 
going in and learning about your inner self. And if you're motivated in that direction, you can also discover amazing things about your inner life by seeing that, that the outer is a reflection of, of it. And that there's a, like, you use the term reciprocal, and I think that that's um, a very important principle, the reciprocity between the inner and the outer. In your art? Mm -hmm. In the golden mean shape of the paper? Yeah. Right. Now, do you do that consciously? You know how to lay out it? Purposely. Yeah, so you know how to lay out a golden rectangle and get those proportions. Right. right. But see, there, there, are, there are artists who have worked subconsciously, mm -hmm. and they'll come very close to it. I think, though, that, you know, the, the idea, like Hambridge used to say, it's not like you're... The idea here is, you know, you're... you're, you're your left brain and your right brain can work in consonance with one another. You can train your left brain to understand the mathematics, but again, it's reciprocity. You know, you activate, you, and, and that's the thing, like a, good, a, a scientist will tell you, you know, they'll spend a year or two, they'll analyze something, they'll think about it, they'll be, you know, you know, taking it apart and looking at it and putting it back together, and then at some point when they're least expecting it, usually when they're completely unprepared, they have the revelation. But in the revelation is a right brain phenomena. But the right brain is finally responding to all of this left brain activity that, 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 that's been going on in the scientist's mind. And um, finally it's triggered this response. Because the brain is a whole system. It just happens to have two, sem two hemispheres to facilitate, I think, our survival in this world. It helps to be able to think things through uh, critically and know what, uh, what's safe and what's dangerous and what works and what doesn't work. Okay, so let's get to some of the slides here.